Hello, thanks for watching, and welcome to the next video in my series on basic statistics. Now, a few things before we get started. Number one, if you're watching this video because you are struggling in a class right now, I want you to stay positive and keep your head up. If you're watching this, it means you've accomplished quite a bit already. You're very smart and talented, and you may have just hit a temporary rough patch. Now, I know with the right amount of hard work, practice, and patience, you can get through it. I have faith in you. Many other people around you have faith in you. So, so should you. Number two, please feel free to follow me here on YouTube, on Twitter, or on LinkedIn. That way, when I upload a new video, you know about it. And on the topic of the video, if you like it, please give it a thumbs up. Share it with classmates or colleagues or put it on a playlist because that does encourage me to keep making them. On the flip side, if you think there is something I can do better, please leave a constructive comment below the video on YouTube, and I will try to take those ideas into account when I make new ones. And finally, just keep in mind that these videos are meant for individuals who are relatively new to stats, so I'm just going over basic concepts, and I will be doing so in a slow, deliberate manner. Not only do I want you to understand what's going on, but also why. So all that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So this video is the next in the beginning series of inferential statistics. Now saying the beginning of inferential statistics is like saying the beach is the beginning of the ocean. Because so much of statistics, and if you really think about it, pretty much everything in statistics is inferential. And again, I talked about that idea in the previews, the videos leading up to this one, so I won't go into all that right now. So what we're going to talk about in this video is a concept that I unfortunately think is neglected in many stats classes. So in previous videos, I talked about how I think covariance and the covariance matrix is skipped over. Um, this is one of those concepts, and it's called the standard error of the mean. And when we are estimating a parameter about a population, the standard error of the mean is fundamentally absolutely important to grasping that estimation. So I really want you to understand what the standard error of the mean is um, so you can then apply it to the estima estimators we are using in statistics. Now we'll say the general term standard error of the estimate the standard error of the mean is just one of those standard errors of the estimate. So the mean is one of the estimates. So if you ever hear standard error of the estimate, the mean is just sort of a subset of that. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this topic. So this problem is the same one we've been using um, in the previous video. So I'm going to go over it very quickly. I'm not going to do any ab living. I just want you to understand the problem. So Highway Paving is a company specializing in residential road surfacing. Many of its clients seek out its specialized product, which is low noise pavement. Recycled rubber can be added to asphalt mixtures to reduce road noise, which appeals to environmentally conscious clients because the, the tires are recycled. And it's good for people in the neighborhood and in the car because it reduces noise, road noise for everyone. However, the viscosity of the asphalt it's resistance to flow, okay? Think of it in sort of layperson's terms, it's thickness, okay? It must be maintained within very tight limits. Otherwise, it may be too thick or too sort of watery and thin to use. So you can imagine having very thick asphalt that's hard to transport, and then you try to get it out of the truck and it, it sticks to everything, um, and you can't spread it around because it's too thick. On the other side, it may be too thin, so it, it comes out and you try to spread it, but it, it won't hold its shape. It just wants, wants to run everywhere. So the viscosity of the asphalt is very important. Now, for this company, the goal okay, is 3,200, and for the purpose of this video, we're going to treat 3,200 as the population mean. So, over several years of production and quality measurements... The company has determined that the viscosity, population, mean, and standard deviation for the low noise payment are as follows. So the population mean is 3,200, and the population standard deviation is 150. So remember, when we use the Greek letter mu, 
that's the population mean, and the Greek letter sigma is the population standard deviation. So 3200 and 150. Now this is a very important point down here below that I want you to really understand and you may have even come across it already in your class. We seldom know the population parameters. Now if we knew the population parameters, like the mean, the population mean, and standard deviation, why would we be trying to estimate them? So we learn using examples like this first, where we do know these parameters, because it helps us better understand sort of the ugly reality, which is most often we don't know these. So again, you can think about this in another example. So if I wanted to know the average income of everyone in the state of Ohio here in the U.S., for example, I can't go out, there's no way that I could go out and ask every single income earner in the entire state of Ohio what their income is. There's just no way. So I would have to pull a sample of income earners, okay? The time and expense and the practical logistics of trying to ask everyone is just ridiculous, okay? So we very subtly know a population parameter um, unless it's somehow kept in a database somewhere automatically, okay? But very subtly do we know that. So, during the manufacturing of each batch of asphalt, the quality control specialist takes 15 specimens or samples of the material and tests the viscosity. Now, when I say takes 15 samples, I meant to change that word, samples. I think of it as 15 measurements or 15 specimens. I think of a sample as the collection of those 15 measurements. Now, this ensures the batch has uniform viscosity as well because they test the viscosity in different parts of the batch. So they want to make sure there's no areas that are sort of thicker and there are no areas in the batch that are thinner. So the, uh, s the specimens come from all throughout the batch, and there are 15 that are taken for each batch. So things to note. There's no way to test every ounce of asphalt, okay? Therefore, the company must take samples. Now, from those samples, the company must then make inferences about the entire batch, and that's sort of the idea behind inferential statistics. The inferences made using these samples are by, de by definition incomplete. Therefore, the sample characteristics will always have some error built in. And again, that's one of the fundamental ideas of inferential statistics. There are these things called error terms or margins of error on the end of everything because the samples are not perfect. And they never really can be perfect unless you sample everything in the population, but then that defeats the purpose. The company took nine samples. Now, each sample has 15 measurements in it. So sample one had 15 measurements, 15 specimens, and that sample mean was 3210.73. Then they took another sample, sample number two, that had 15 uh, measurements in it. That sample mean was 3150.13. So you can see how these samples work, okay? So they took nine samples, each of the same size, 15 measurements, and these are the sample means for all nine samples. So we could do a curve for each one. So sample one, three, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and you can see that it's um, X bar subscript one, X bar subscript two. That means sample one, sample two, sample three, etc. And those are the measurements for each sample. So again, think about each sample mean as having its own distribution like this, okay? That's something I want you to get into your mind when you're taking multiple samples from a population. Each sample has its own sample characteristics. Now here are our samples again. Now what I did is I created some ranges, some, you know, not, almost 100, because it's 49.99 is the end of the range, um, of measurements. So you can see that we had one measurement in the 2950 to 3049 range, that's the one at the very bottom. We had one in the 3050 to 3149 range, and then we had four in the next range, etc. Now, of course, we call this the sampling distribution. This is a distribution of the sample means. A distribution of the sample means of these nine 
sample means. Now, the way I figured this out, the expected value of this overall sample, the sample means, was 3217.08. Now, what, how did I do that? Now, in this case, what I did is I just took the average of the mean of the sample means. And that's because each sample was the same size. So they are weighted the same. So I went ahead and just took the average of the sample mean column, and that gave me sort of an expected value of the overall distribution of 3217.08. So basically, another way of thinking about it is instead of treating these as nine different samples, I kind of treated it as one large sample of 135 specimens to get this expected value. Okay, but again, that's not really that important for what we're doing here, but I just want to show you where that came from. Now we can actually turn that on its side and we have a histogram like this. So you can see for each range, we have a certain number. So we had one measurement in the first range, we had one measurement in the second, four in the middle, etc. The thing is, what does this shape look like? Well, if you kind of look at this as a normal bell curve, that's very important. Okay, so this looks like a normal bell curve. And that's actually related to something that you've probably heard of called the central limit theorem. And that is if we take a large number of samples from basically any population of any shape, we take many samples and we create a sampling distribution like this, the sampling distribution will be normally distributed like the bell curve. Okay. Now there are many versions of the central limit theorem, but that's the one that's most applicable to at least this part of introductory statistics. Okay, so the expected value or the mean of our sampling distribution. So you can see over here we have our graph. Now in this, I want you to pause just for a second and look about what I'm saying here. Now the expected value of many samples, okay, so x bar sub n. Many samples we take, we take their mean, we take 30 samples and we have the mean. As that number of samples becomes large. Okay, in this case we did nine. Well, let's say we did a hundred. Now the mean of that sampling distribution is the population mean. Because remember, we're not, in this case we know the population mean, but in many cases we don't. So basically what this is saying is that if we take a large number of samples, okay, and then we put all those samples into a distribution like this here on the right, the mean of that distribution is the same as the population mean we do not know. Expected value of uh, X bar, which is the sampling distribution mean, that's the expected value of X bar. So that's the expected value of that, the sample of this distribution. And of course, mu is the population mean. So the way this works is that if we take many samples, we create this distribution, then the mean of this distribution is the same as our population mean. That's the idea. Now, again, I can explain this like I did in the previous video in sort of plain English, but no matter how I simplified it, it still sounds like a riddle. But if we take many random samples from the population, okay, each sample will have its own sample mean. So in this previous slide, we did nine. Then we create a distribution based on all of those sample means, which is what we have here in the upper right. Then the mean of that sampling distribution up here in the right is equal to the mean of the population. So again, that's a way of saying exactly it's everything on this slide. Okay. So it can be, take your time to wrap your head around that, but that's basically what we're talking about here. Let's remember this is an estimate at best. The expected value of the sampling distribution is at best going to be an estimate of the population mean mu. We would have to take every conceivable sample from the population to match the population mean perfectly. But if we do that, what is the point of sampling in the first place? The best we're going to be able to do is to find an interval estimate for the population mean mu. Now our interval estimate will be influenced by sample size. And that's really the heart of this video. 
and the degree of confidence we are satisfied with. So we're going to find this sample mean. It is not going to be perfect. But we can make it better through the sample size we take and depending on the degree of confidence we want to have, whether or not that is representative of our population mean. So that's at the heart of what we're doing. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually talk about what the standard error of the mean is. So everything up to now was precursor to understand what we're actually wanting to talk about right here. Okay, but I had to make sure you had that sort of pre-knowledge before we could actually get to this. So up to now, we have talked about the mean of this sampling distribution over here on the right. But now we're interested not in the mean of this sampling distribution, but its standard deviation. So that is what the standard error of the mean is. The standard error of the mean is the standard deviation of this sampling distribution. So standard error of the mean. Now it has this uh, formula here, okay? Now we're gonna use this formula here in a second, but I just wanted to sort of you decode what it is. So what is this saying? Sigma sub X bar, okay? It's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution over here on the right. So that's what we're trying to find. Now, sigma is the standard deviation of the population. Now, in this case, we know it because we are given it at the beginning. But in most situations, we don't know it, which we'll save that for a different video. But in this case, we do know that. So sigma there on the top is the standard deviation of the population. And of course, n is the sample size. So we, to find the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, which is another way of saying find the standard error of the mean, we really need to know two things, the standard deviation of the population and its sample size. Now, it's important to point out again that this first example assumes we know the population standard deviation, sigma there at the top, but this is really the case. We will talk about what to do when sigma is unknown in a later video. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a simple calculation. So to find the standard error of the mean, we have our formula here. Now we know that the sigma sub x, that is the standard deviation of this distribution over here on the right, is what we're looking for. Now we are told at the beginning of this problem that the population standard deviation was 150. Now remember our sample size for our samples was 15. Okay, so n is 15. Now if we go ahead and calculate that out, we have 150 divided by the square root of 15, which equals 38.7. So what we are saying here is that the standard deviation of this distribution over here on the right hand side is 38.17. Now, note how the sample size changes the standard error of the mean. And I'm going to show you a real example here on the next slide. But notice that the sample size is in the denominator of this fraction. So, as sample size gets larger, as n becomes larger, what happens to this overall fraction? Well, remember, sigma stays constant, okay, because that's the population standard deviation. But as n becomes larger, that denominator becomes larger, therefore the overall fraction becomes smaller, okay? And this is extremely important in thinking about the influence of sample size, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at this. The influence of sample size. Now our sample in the first case was 15. So we figured out a standard error of the mean was 38.7. Now what happens if we change that sample size to 135? Look what happens to the standard error of the mean now. It goes down to 12.9. So the standard error of the mean which is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, 
which is in the same way of saying the variation of the sampling distribution goes from 38.7 to 12.9 by increasing the sample size. What about if we increase it to 500? Well, now the standard error of the mean is 6.71. So, as the sample size increases, what happens to the standard error? Well, it decreases. A better way to think about it is that it narrows. When the standard deviation decreases, the distribution around the mean literally narrows or squishes in around the mean. A larger sample size reduces the standard error, and which actually means it reduces the variability, it reduces the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So if we have three curves like this, now with a sample size of 15, it may look like the green curve. Now if you notice, the green curve is shorter in the middle and it has wider or fatter tails. So there is more variation in that curve because the standard deviation is larger. Then we move up to a sample size of 135. Well, that curve is narrower and taller in the middle and the tails are shorter or thinner. So more probability is pushed in towards that mean okay, of 3200. It's the probability is pushed inward. Then with a sample size, say, of maybe 500, the probability is pushed in even further because the standard deviation is smaller. So the curve is squished in towards the mean. So a larger sample size decreases, or you can think of it as narrowing this, this uh, curve, which is the standard error, which again is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So the values of X bar and the sampling distribution will have less variation and therefore will be closer to the actual population mean. So larger sample size reduces the standard error that gives us a better approximation of our actual population mean. Now, pause here for a second. This should make intuitive sense. If I do want to know the average income of every person in the state of Ohio here in the United States, what do you think is a better technique? I go out and ask four people their income, or I go out and ask 10,000. Which do you think is going to give a closer approximation to the actual mean income for the entire state? Well, it's going to be the survey that asks 10,000 people. And why is it going to be better? Well, we just showed that because the sample size is in the denominator of the standard error, it is going to decrease the error. Okay, it's going to decrease that uh, standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So that's how sample size comes to be so important because it reduces the standard error in these estimates. Now, a larger sample size up to a point generates a better approximation of the underlying population because it minimizes this error. Now, there is a point, and there's a way I could maybe show you this in another video, where increasing the sample size further doesn't really get you much more. And really, to tell you the honest truth, the simple way to, to show that, you can go into any graphing calculator or any graphing calculator online, and you can actually graph the function that we had in the previous slide. So we could graph 150 divided by the square root of x. And of course, x is our sample size. So we would have a graph for every conceivable sample size um, given the population um, standard deviation that we could come up with. And in the next video, maybe I'll actually do that for you. So, but there's a point where a larger sample just doesn't give us anything more, okay? So it's not infinite. Now this also has one more important implication. 
So if we look at the standard error of the mean over here on the left, this is everything we've had before. So their population standard deviation was 150, and our sample size was 15. So we put that into our formula, and we have a standard error of the mean of 38.7. Now, if you're sort of intuitive, you may have sensed this already. But there's a really important thing here um, as far as the sample sizes we pick. And that is the standard error of the mean, sigma x bar, is the same for all samples of the same size. So, in this case, any sample of size 15 will have a standard error of the mean of 38.7, assuming that population standard deviation of 150 remains the same. So if you look in the formula there, there are only two pieces. The population center deviation sigma there on the top, which we're given, and the sample size in the denominator. So what that means is that any sample size that's the, you know, the same sample size will have the exact same standard error of the mean. And that's a really important thing when we're talking about the sample sizes we choose from the population and things like that. So what would this actually look like in terms of our samples? So here were our nine samples we took from the asphalt batch. So we have sample one, sample two, sample three, sample four. Now they all have different sample means. But remember, the sample size for each one was 15. So what does that mean for their standard errors of the mean? Well, they are all 38.7. So even though each sample has its own sample mean, the standard error of the mean is the exact same. And that's because the sample size is the exact same. Now another question some of my students have when I work with them is, they get this, the sigmas confused. So they ask, well, why is the standard error of the mean, the sigma x bar, so much smaller than sigma, which is the population standard deviation? And the quick answer is, is that they're measuring the standard deviations of two completely different distributions. So just sigma is the standard deviation of the population we're interested in. Sigma x bar is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So it's the distribution of all these samples. Okay, so the sigmas are measuring two different things. So it's really easy to get them confused, but just keep in mind that they are the standard deviations of two completely different things. But I do want to point out here the fact that any sample that's the same size as the next sample, the next sample, the next sample, in this case they're all 15, no matter what the sample mean is, they will all have the same standard error of the mean. Okay, so remember, standard error summary. The standard error of the mean is another name for the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Standard deviations allow us to calculate z-scores, and therefore the area or probability under the curve for certain regions. Now, any point estimator is just that. It's an estimation, therefore it will contain error. This error term can be minimized by selecting a large sample from the population up to a point. The error component means we cannot nail down a parameter perfectly. We can only provide a range or an interval that may cover the parameter. We call those confidence intervals. Now, most often, we do not know the population standard deviation. Therefore, we have to estimate it and make necessary adjustments. And that's going to be the topic of one of our next videos. Okay, so we have covered a very important concept, and that is the standard error of the mean. So, when we do not necessarily know the mean of the population, but maybe we do know the population standard deviation, which we most often don't know that either. 
But what we're doing here is we're taking sample data and we are estimating some parameter in the population, usually the mean and the standard deviation. So the standard error of the mean tells us sort of how close we can get to the actual population mean. And of course we learned that that is influenced by sample size up to a point after which a larger sample does not do us any good. So it's all about inferring or estimating a population parameter from a sample. And that's one of the fundamental ideas in basic statistics. Okay, so if you're watching this video because you are struggling in a class, stay positive and keep your chin up. You're smart and talented. I know it. Everyone else around you knows it. So you should think that too. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with classmates or colleagues, or put it on a playlist. That does encourage me to keep making them. On the flip side, if you think there is something I can do better, please leave a constructive comment below the video, and I will try to take those ideas into account when I make new ones. And finally, just remember that the fact that you're on here trying to learn, trying to improve yourself as a student or as a business person, that is what really matters. I'm a firm believer that if you have a good learning process in place, the results will take care of themselves. So thank you very much for watching. I wish you all the best of luck in your studies and in your work. And I do look forward to seeing you again next time.